Hello everyone, welcome to an awesome FileMaker Friday. I'm Richard Carlton. I got Jacob over my head. There we go. There's Jacob Taylor. Hey Jacob, how's it going? Welcome to FMTrain.tv where we produce and make available daily live streams at one o'clock on the FileMaker platform. It is pretty awesome stuff. Uh, every day, every day. It's been over a year now. This is FMTrain.tv. I've been in the FileMaker business 31 years. The last 10 years, we've been producing awesome FileMaker training. And we just released a book. Most of you got an email about the book. If you're a current FileMaker subscriber, you got the book in the download. If you've never bought anything from us or you're not a current subscriber, then it's a $20 book, but we are asking that uh, Ryan just reaches out to you, make sure that you're a real human being, right? And that you, uh, any questions you have, because typically people always have questions about FileMaker. And so we'll give you the $20 book, but we need about a two minute conversation just to make sure that uh, you are not an alien from Mars. Uh, we put the anti-robot stuff in there, but we still seem to have robots that sneak through, people sneak through who are, shouldn't be sneaking through us. Upcoming broadcast schedule. If you go to fmtrain.tv and you go here, right? So you go to the website and then you press the live tab right here you can see the upcoming schedule we are going to do training on basically how we built this more or less basic reading and writing through from a website to filemaker using the data api that's not today that's another server day we're going to be doing that at least one or two three days doing that um I don't see us being able to do it really in one day. So today is day two of our server conversation. Uh, then Monday we got Nick Hunter doing a one hour reskin uh, of, uh, of the, uh, it was the Wolfpack sample file. It came to us kind of a little bit on the ugly side. And then he, Nick uses awesome design sense to clean it up. And it's always inspirational to watch Nick go. So that's what that's gonna be about. Um, it's not gonna be so much about coding, it's about pixel alignment and pixel design and things on layouts, right? So there you go. Then Tuesday, Wednesday, next week, I got painting yourself into a corner. Jake, uh, Christian Olson is going to take over this conversation. I'm going to try to get a prop made up for us if we can. Um, uh, looks like Monday I will be out. Uh, I'll be out in a little bit today. So let's cover about, so this is the upcoming schedule. We got digging through a new version of FileMaker. There's all sorts of amazing topics. We got topics booked out at least about a month in advance right now. It's pretty Awesome. On t uh, Twitch, we got uh, Alpha Lima 92651 and Farkle 5, which is awesome. Call sign for fighter jet. Farkle 5, you're cleared hot. Altitude at your discretion. Weapons free. Um, J Mon Han 54. Awesome as well. So today is more about FileMaker Server. If you want to support the channel, you, listen, you, you love puppies. Do you love kitties? Are you a good person? Then you should support the channel. You support the channel by going to bundles and choosing a bundle and using your credit card. And this is a one time a year kind of thing and you get an awesome training package. A lot of you already have this. I want to thank you for that. But if you don't hate but if you don't hate uh, bunnies and puppies and cats, then you should have this, right? Everyone who loves animals and is a good person should have this training, right? No peer pressure, right, Jacob Taylor? No, none at all. So I'm going to step out in about 30 minutes, and Michael is going to help make sure the broadcast keeps running here. So you're there. We see you, Jacob Taylor. So do you so you want to pick up the conversation yesterday about the file maker server open Q and A, right? Questions and answers. Did you you had mm -hmm. a you had a, uh, a, a list of recommendations? We posted that and did YouTube, Twitch, and Discord. I'm going to ask TK to find the link, and then we want to kind of re I'm going to post it to YouTube real quick. I'm going to just so everyone mm -hmm. sees it. But these are what we have some people, would you say that they kind of want to roll their own configuration or whatever, right? Yeah, so we occasionally have clients that, uh, you know, while everybody loves RCC, I'm sure, um, occasionally they just want to do it themselves. They have either internal IT people or um, or they just, they don't want help. They're like, nope, I'm going to figure it out myself. I want to run it myself, et cetera. Um, and so... For, it's a, to be clear, it's a small subset of customers, but for the ones that it, they just don't want assistance, um, I took our internal documentation uh, that's like, here's, you know, we train new people how to set up servers, um, mostly on Amazon, which is why this is for Windows. Um, but, you know, you can look at it and say, all right, how would I accomplish the same thing on Mac or Linux or anything else? Um, and so I, I took our directions and I said, all right, what are like the 10 or so key things everybody needs to do? Um, and we put those into a document for everybody so that you okay. can. So and are we going to update that document a little bit or is it is it mostly up to date or is it kind of up to date? Or are you going to go through it or what are we going to do? Um, we can go. Th so we'll go through it today. Um, it is mostly up to date. Um, it 
we were talking about this before stream, it uh, doesn't really cover the data API or any of the requirements you might want for that. Um, Okay, so I'm why don't not... we flip to your screen and we can take a yeah. look at that. I'm going to go there and then because it's okay. uh, because actually right now it's kind of funny this conversation popped up because if you try to run the, the installer for FileMaker Server, the current installer for 19 on Windows, it doesn't work, right? Is that, is that, do I have that correct? Like we were having this conversation? Yeah, in um, if basically if you run it inside of Amazon right now, it will fail um, on install fairly reliably. Um, I can kind of explain why that is. It's a kind of a simple. Oh yeah, let me pull the big thing off. Um, it's it's a it's a fairly straightforward problem, but like anything else, it's like something Claire's needs to address basically. Um, and it it's part of a bigger issue that kind of stands right now, which is um, Claire's is trying to figure out how to deal with. There, there's a couple things that the server software needs to operate itself um, that ha that are you know prerequisites to FileMaker Server operating, especially on Windows specifically, and uh, they're you know trying to automatically install those things. And because there can be other versions of those things installed already, uh, you know, etc. Um, there's a bunch of complexity that they're trying to deal with uh, as far as making that work. Um, and so we get, every time they put out another patch, you know, it's a slightly different behavior and an improvement in some area, but it's not like universally dealt with at present. Um, the I suppose the very short version of the explanation is, um, so on, uh, when you install a FileMaker server on Windows, one of the things that it needs, which if you've done Windows stuff, you'll be familiar, there's a, a visual C++ library that like, half of stuff on Windows uses. Um, FileMaker Server uses a particular version of that, which is fine because it comes with it. Um, but if by chance you installed anything else on the server before you put FileMaker Server on uh, and there's like an overlapping version, uh, it doesn't It just, It just. doesn't do smart things. It doesn't do the right thing. So um, for example, Microsoft now has taken uh, the visual C++ and they, they don't, you know, it used to be you got the individual version. So there'd be the 2015 version and the 2017 and the 2019 or whatever. There'd be individual downloads for each of those. And for all of the recent versions, which is 15 through 19, um, they packed it into one installation package, which is great, except that FileMaker server doesn't know what that is or understand it and is expecting a particular version of the library, for example. And so it goes, checks, finds, you know, something other than what it's looking for, um, and then just bails, basically. So um, it's basically just annoying to deal with, but uh, it's something that Claris will get resolved here uh, very shortly, so. Okay, cool. So what is our checklist look like? And then if you folks have questions about this checklist, we're gonna kind of drive through it a little bit, but this is, you know, the recommendations on building out Windows. And the reason we're talking about Windows, it seems to be majority of the installs this way. Um, mm -hmm. If Christian Schmitz from Monkey Bread has any questions, he's here once again. Um, one of the people that I greatly uh, love in terms of third-party products that we will use without much fear uh, is Monkey Bread and the Goya Base Elements plugin and the 360 plugins. Yep. Um, great products. And so he's here. So if we uh, throw up, uh, if someone says, oh, FileMaker can't do that, it'll be really funny to see Christian Schmidt. He'll, he'll, Christian will go, oh, yeah. But my plugin does it. <laughs> mm -hmm. He's like almost every time. It's like, yep, it's in there, right? It's like, yep, it's in there, right? So, all right, so yep, go for it, Jake. Go, Jake. Yep, absolutely. Um, and I, just like I mentioned earlier, just as a prereq to this, uh, if you all are running Macs, if you have Mac servers or even Linux servers, um, there's certain things in this that are kind of specific to Windows, and you can either do one of two things with that: you can throw it out as a requirement, or you can look at it and see if you can accomplish the same thing through other means um for example like we tell everybody yeah like you know when we build our cloud servers we put the database on a drive we have a backups drive that's separate from that um and you may not actually be able to do that in a real sense on like an on-site mac mini because uh at least the live database the operating system and probably a, a subset of the backups are going to be on the boot drive um that's how the computer works so um but you could say well okay so we want backups all over the place that's the the goal that we're aiming for here. So you put an external drive in, et cetera. Um, and so just there's different ways to like meet the same requirements. So we'll just step through this really fast. Um, I have a suspicion you all are gonna pepper me with questions here in just a minute. So uh, we'll, 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 we'll get started. Um, so the main thing that I recommend for FileMaker servers, uh, and this is based on Claris's own recommendations, um, 
actually want to probably update the verbiage on this just a little bit. Um, it's And it's because I learned a couple interesting things. So uh, Claris has been deploying Cloud2 now for, I think we're fully over a year and getting, getting close to the second year of that platform existing. Um, and one of the interesting things that they did, I think either late last year or early this year, is they bumped everyone to a large instance. And what that means is even if you, pay, even if you get the cheap plan, um, you have eight gigs of RAM, uh, which is important for FileMaker Server in-memory cache. Um, that is their official uh, minimum size. We obviously uh, actually will set up servers that are less than that, but it's it has to be right for the client. Um, for example, we'll, we'll put people on medium servers, which only have four gigabytes of RAM. That does obviously uh, limit how much in-memory cache you can have and things like that. Um, and it's cheaper too, which is why for those customers it works. Um, but if you're not you know, using the platform too heavily, you don't have a billion plugins and 17 different scheduled scripts and all this stuff, it can work out just fine. Um, but just in general, there's, their minimum recommendations are eight gigs of RAM. Um, the main thing here actually after you've you know, if you have enough RAM for your users is the SSD. And that's actually why I put it first because RAM is usually pretty cheap. Um, but some people are still nervous about buying SSDs because they're, they're more expensive than a fat rate array. Um, the, the prices are finally comparable in the last couple of years, but for anybody who hasn't done it in a, you know, hasn't done a new server in a few years, uh, they might be, you know, surprised to find that out basically. Um, and that's going to be, the, frankly, the most important thing is having an SSD under the database specifically. Um, and you probably want one of your backups on something like an SSD because those can, it, it, I mean, in a literal sense, it helps the backup speed as well. That doesn't really matter for system performance necessarily. But if backups take forever, take a long time to run, um, then that can cause issues. Uh, and then... You will want at least a dual core. Um, I actually find that to be a, a, a really important requirement. Um, some people will try and, for example, they'll they'll give me 16. They'll you know it'll be an on-site virtual server or something like that, and they'll go, oh yeah, great. Like you know we'll give you 16 gigs of RAM for sure for FileMaker server. They've got maybe you know 10, 15 people, something like that. So yeah, great. Uh, you know this looks good. Uh, you know I'm not seeing any issues. And then we get into the we get into the server installation, and it turns out they've given us a single core because they weren't. You know, they didn't ask or they weren't sure how many to do or whatever, and I, you know, failed to mention it to them. Um, I actually want to note that because um, if you if you're going to have, and I say five users here, which is a good point, but really, if you're over ten users, you want a, you want in general, you're going to want a quad core, um, especially if you're using any of the other features. If it's not just Pro, you know, there's you. If you have anything, you, you've got scheduled scripts, you have any plugins, you have processes that need to run, et cetera, um, you will want the quad core. And the reason for that is because um, each of the bits of FileMaker server, there's the database engine, there's the script engine that runs on the server, there's WebDirect, there's you know uh, the data API. Each of these things can run on its own core and most of them aren't, uh, aren't properly multi-core. So they won't like spread out and Oh, you know, I have this big script to run on server, and the database engine's kind of loafing. So, you know, I'm just going to and take all the take all the free computation power. Um, yeah, they won't. It, not all. It, most it of the processes won't do that. They don't do that. They don't. They're very I, I think literally the script engine specifically, which is why it's actually a bad example. I think that one does. None of the others do. So. Um, and yeah, <laughs> and so if you're if you're going to be doing that, it's like well, if you're going to hammer the database server, uh, and you have this script running, and that's what's doing the hammering of the database server, you're going to want free horsepower for both. And then obviously there's the rest of the operating system and anything else that might go on on the server. So you're already talking about well, we want three cores, so you know, um, du dual core at least, but probably quad core for most of these things. Um, and for on-site Mac Mini people, that's why we tell them to get usually the i5, um, sometimes the i7 if you're going to put a lot of people on it, but the i5 will do most of our most of our clients. Okay, so someone just reported that there was a bit.ly problem with this document. I just pressed the, the link and it bounced and worked correctly for me. Um, um, so uh, it, it drops the PDF on my Plus. desk and it's version rev3. So yeah, so if it's not check. working, then... It is, uh, yeah, that's an HTTP, that's why. Um, the inter the intermediary link is HTTP. That's why it's failing for people. All right, I'm gonna post this one. 
apologies, we're just going to do it live on air. If you, if you would paste that link, that's the actual one that's behind the bit.ly. Uh, yes, it will work for, sorry, it will work for some people. Um, uh, web browsers generally are trying to increase the security of web browsing. Uh, and so one of the new sort of requirements, it's not like everyone, not every browser has it, you know, uh, Chrome is who's rolling this out first, um, but they're not, they haven't given this setting, if you will, to everybody. Um, they're slowly increasing, slowly increasing who has it. Um, and, but the, the basically what it is, is if you're going to go download a file, uh, they would like the whole, like if you're going to, you click a link to, you know, it goes to a PDF at the end or something. Um, they want that whole, you've clicked a link and it jump, 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 bam. And at the back, back end of this little chain is a PDF. They want that whole thing to be HTTPS links. Um, because if it's not, theoretically someone could insert something in there and redirect you to the wrong place, give you a you know malware laden PDF or whatever it is that you're downloading. Um, and that, that is a potential, I say it's a potential risk, but it is a real thing. Um, and so they're they're trying to do it where uh, some some people, when this thing is enabled, if there's any kind of an insecure link in in that set of jumps that you make to get to the file at the end, um, it will fail, basically. Um, it just stops at the insecure link and goes, ah, I don't know what to do. And so you end up with like a blank page. Um, it'll be, once everybody gets their links all the way updated and all that stuff, it'll be fine again. But um, for the, probably about the next year, there's going to be various challenges um, all over the internet as they roll this stuff out and everybody becomes compliant and that sort of thing. So, um, all right, so we'll go to number one. Yeah, uh, just keep chipping through this, Jacob. There is a couple conversations yep. going on on the Discord side about uh, about the SSD versus MVME, right? The new uh, interface for some of this uh, flash type memory storage, right? And uh, good good articles in there that, that Ruben picked out to us. But yeah, we want to pick that up as you get to the end of this in terms of backup mm -hmm. speed and things like that. So yeah. Yep. Yeah, we can cover that as well. Um, so the big one here that I am aware for all of anybody who does, you know, regular big company IT stuff, because um, we're telling people to turn off Windows updates and everyone is shouting very loudly to not to, to have automatic Windows updates on. Um, so you do want to still install updates, just to be clear, um, just manually. Uh, and this is why we have the, this this one dot a here is our short explanation. So there are situations under which, especially if they're, and you may not know this at the time, but if someone is in the system, uh, FileMaker Server can take an exceedingly long period of time to shut down. Um, the the uh, the actual like worst worst case cascading sort of issue is if your backups take a long time. A backup starts and Windows goes, oh yeah, we need to reboot for Windows updates. Okay, FileMaker Server will do absolutely nothing until that backup is completed. Um, it doesn't care if the system's rebooting or what's happening. So that can be really bad, actually. Um, that's that's basically the worst case scenario and it would be bad timing functionally. Um, but even if nothing else is going on, uh, the basic issue is that we don't generally trust FileMaker Server to be able to safely close the database in an automated fashion. Um, it can if you tell it to and you're confident they're closed and then you reboot. But you know the idea of window of an automatic Windows update is I don't have to think about the server. It you know at 5 p.m. on Sunday or whatever. Um, you know, has installed at that point and then goes for its little reboot and comes back up again. Um, and yeah, if no one ever is on there at 5 p.m. on Sunday or whatever, um, then that may work. Um, but as a general recommendation, we still tell people to turn it off and do manual manual updates. Um, that's still the safer option. Um, Claris is working on um, the parts of the server product that will enable things like automatic updates eventually. Um, we're just not confident and you know, super excited and say, yep, mm -hmm, that, you know, it's there, it's ready, we'll use it. Yeah, so. I mean, the two sides of this conversation is that you're going to run into a deal where uh, you don't, you, you turn them off and you don't run this, have that you run, don't run this risk of, because the risk is it, it runs an update, it doesn't shut down correctly, it hangs, it blows up, it wrecks the, the live files, whatever it does, right? Pick the issue. Yep. It results in a phone call automatically in the morning to the developer, which very well may be you or the server administrator. That's that's the one side. The other side is we had a customer who did this, and they got they got hacked and blown up. And I'm not going to name names or point point at people, but they had the uh, they turned it off 
but then they never ran the updates, right? If you turn this off up here, right? We turn this off, then you actually have to be a good person with a little smile on your face, and you have to go and run your updates, when, you know, on a frequent basis manually. If you, but we had someone turn it off, then they never ran the updates, so their their stuff was out of date three or four years, and they got hacked, and uh, and it, their database, their server, I think, was like zeroed out. I just wiped the, the server. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's so, what they were. That's what the hacker was trying to do. Zero yeah. everything. Yeah, and so yeah, and so that was an interesting scenario, which which brings back, frankly, the a conversation we had uh, last week or the week before with 360 Works when they really are working on this new, um, I don't know, crash guard or crash whatever it is. It's the back offsite backup, and it has the um, you know the ability to make offsite backups, and then you can't delete them for like days at all, zero. Can't delete them at all, no matter what. So even if someone gets into your stuff, you're like really armor plated, which I think is fantastic. So anyway, yeah. I'm off topic, but yeah, so. Yeah, no, I, I, that was a that was a cool demo that he did. Um, I wanna cover also a couple questions. So uh, Kyle Williams in Discord uh, noted that he had an IT person tell him, you know, port 80 is not a secure port, which uh, can be true. Uh, but you can turn any port to be a secure port if you, you know, make the app on the other side communicate securely. Um, but what that is kind of driving at, because I've had I've had other clients ask the same question. So one of the things that's proliferating kind of outside of RCC um, is like cyber insurance, um, and those uh, in the insurance, it's like a, a breach insurance or whatever. They'll pay certain fees and stuff like that um, to to for kind of CYA purposes. Um, and so uh, those documents will specify like minimum IT standards. And it's like, you need to have rules dealing with this kind of stuff on your network firewalls, which means, and then you should have this kind, you know, this general kind of network firewall. And, you know, it has all those things kind of specified out and assuming you meet those requirements, um, the insurance company will insure you and they'll write a contract, you know, write, write an insurance policy for you. Um, and so as part of that, uh, I actually had a client ask if they could close port 80 because they're like, you know, my insurance thing says if we can have it closed, like thumbs up, we're good, let's do it. Um, and so, yeah, it's it's uh, in a technical sense, um, any port can be secure. However, uh, in with FileMaker Server, that's why we note here for number 3B specifically. Um, so, and it, it's not even, not even strictly true anymore that port 80 is just, there's no SSL whatsoever. Um, it's just that if you haven't installed a custom SSL certificate in the server, you're gonna be using the built-in one for FileMaker, um, which is fine because uh, your data is still at least encrypted, but there's no verification going on. So if someone, you know, sits in the middle between you and the server or something, I don't know, they can replace your containers as they come over the wire or something like that. Um, that's suboptimal, but probably not going to kill anybody. So um, you, you would like to avoid it generally still, but anyhow. Um, and then the other good question, uh, Oregon Dean, uh, also in Discord, uh, asked, he's going to be migrating from uh, FileMaker Cloud 1 to uh, the FileMaker Server Linux product. Um, both will be in Amazon, basically. Um, and he's wondering if there will be, you know, if we know of any issues that he's gonna have coming across. Um, generally, I would say no, um, but there's a couple things to be aware of with the FileMaker Server product. Uh, I, I don't know if these things are gonna be resolved, but I honestly expect so. Um, just, I don't know when, eventually. Um, so one of the challenges with the FileMaker Server Linux product currently, um, outside of whatever little bugs might be associated with some version that's out, uh, the installer for it, um, which is a an RPM package uh, for, for CentOS, because that's the currently supported Linux operating system, it, it's not like a regular package where if you install it and then uninstall it, it's perfectly clean, there's no modifications, et cetera. Um, I think they're still working on making the packaging and stuff like that actually clean, but it messes with stuff on the system is a short way to put it. And so functionally you can't actually just, you know, let's say we, we put FileMaker Server 19.2 uh, on the CentOS Linux machine. Um, and I, I don't know, we'll just say next month 19.3 comes out or something and you want to update because there's some bug fix you're interested in. Um, that's a clean install. Uh, you can't just take the 19.3 and you know run it with yum, I think is the package manager there. 
you know, run the updater and say, oh, yeah, you know, 19.2, 19.3. Oh, great. We'll replace all the 19.2 stuff and with the 19.3 stuff and we're good to go. Um, it, it unfortunately does not work that way. It doesn't do uh, kind of what you'd assume on Linux as far as packaging goes, because usually you can just update the new version and that's that's good and that's good to go for most applications okay um, there is a question here i'm going to jump over to this just give you a chance to grab something to drink real quick jacob so uh, yep. muhammad asked the question is there a certain uh limit uh for fmp database size on a filemaker server so um the reality is there probably is a limit um it's going to be mostly based upon uh well, you're gonna, the hardware and the, da the database design, but the biggest database we've seen, what's the biggest one we've seen? 50, 60 gigabytes, 80 gigabytes? What was the one that you... No, that um, that Christian one was 115 or 120. Yeah, and that's Something a little on the unwieldy side. So I would recommend that if you start dealing with FileMaker files that are that big, you look at using separate files for different parts of the solution and even using potentially different FileMaker servers to host different files, if that makes any sense, right? So it's a little bit uh, squirrely and crazy. Uh, so if you have that much – listen, if you're running around with 120 gigabytes of data, you should have a pretty robust business. You can write a check for a big-ass uh, SQL Oracle site type system, right? Um, so, you know, my data – we frequently see 10, 15, 20 gigs. That is not uncommon. And that's just the data. That's not the containers, the scans, the images, things like that. That's just yep. uh, that part of it. So um, that makes sense? So, yep. yeah, so, so really – it's like, you know, if you get a big enough solution going, then you should be making enough money. And then really the issue of I've outgrown FileMaker. It's really hard to outgrow FileMaker, but it is possible, right? So let's just be clear about that. Someone said, I need yeah. 5,000 simultaneous users. I'm like, man, you're right on the edge of probably, even if we set replicated servers up around the world, which we've done with 360 Works uh, worldwide, you know, 2,500, 3,000, 4,000 simultaneous users in one system. <sighs> We're up against the wall on that, so that's kind of like would, the max. Yeah, honestly, though, I like it's that's one of those conversations where I, I honestly, I want somebody to try it so that I can watch, because <laughs> that's like well, a, we, a we system can... like that is just like that. That would be amazing. It, you, just having all you know, whatever those modules are, having everybody beaten against them, and how you'd have to structure that and set it up. I think that'd be really interesting. But yeah, well, we've seen yeah. 120 gigs, 20, 30 gigs. So there you go. So that's it for now. Um, I appreciate it. So I'm going to let Jacob and Michael take over. So I'm going to set the screen to full screen, and I've got a jet uh, out for a quick appointment. I will see all you folks Monday. Mike, uh, you guys have the bridge. Uh, 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 uh. Lieutenant, Thanks, Captain. Lieutenant Taylor, you have the bridge. Ensign, uh, Thank you, Ensign Michael, you know, don't shoot the phasers too hard or you might break the ship. Yes, sir, Captain. You guys can read the firewall stuff. Um, we usually just go over the ports just for – because the network people always want to know, oh, which numbers do we need? Um, there's a couple that aren't noted here. For example, um, yeah, 8443 for uh, containers, you're always going to need 5003 because that's what does FileMaker Pro and FileMaker Go for records. Um, if you want to do any kind of remote administration of the server, port 16,000 gets you to the admin console. Um, if you want a remote desktop port, you'll have something on Windows and Mac that will cover that one port each. Uh, and then the one that's not noted here that you may require separately um, is if you're doing ODBC or JDBC, where the FileMaker server is the data source, um, you know, your FileMaker database or something like that, you're, you're, you're pulling that data into MySQL or, you know, some other, some database system like that, um, you'll need, I think it's 2399 as well. Um, we don't note that because it's like maybe 5% of our clients use it, but let's see. Uh, oh, cool. Yeah, Kyle Williams in Discord notes that the, according to the documentation, the, the actual file size max limit is about eight terabytes, which honestly is impressive. Um, that's pretty big. Yeah, that's a, that's huge. Um, <laughs> I I always forget the number. It's it's one of the things that Nick likes to uh to rattle off, and it's like the what where the cap is on the number of records in a file because it's trillions or something. Um, like you you know you'd have to it would take work to get to eight terabytes. You have um, to really try for that. Yeah, I we have one client whose file is honestly exploding right now, and they're 
it, it may be a structural issue. We're trying to determine kind of what 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 and why because they're not doing enough to generate. It's like a gigabyte a week or something. Um, and they they have a they have a book in business, but uh, it's you know it's not quite enough to really generate that much data. And so, um, but it, but even still, like it's yeah, they won't have, they won't have any huge issues. So we have a question from uh, Mohammed. Do you think it's better to reference the containers rather than including it in the database? Um, that that's a good question. So, um, how do you address that conversation? So, I, so so the short answer is, uh, I I would say if. Um, accessing the documents inside of FileMaker is advantageous to the business. Like it's it's good to have them in front of the users. Then I would do that. Um, but there are potential implications to that. Um, the first one everybody thinks of is, well, if I have a hundred thousand documents, that means if I have backups running every hour, I need to be backing up a hundred thousand things. Um, and so that can um, be stressful, I don't say stressful for the server, mostly that means buy a bigger or faster server. But um, at some point those costs are concerning, we'll say. Uh, and so we're, we're actually gonna go over one of the solutions to that, I think in a future stream, uh, I call it the split container uh, setup. Uh, and it, but it's basically where you're, you, you stop backing up the container data, at least with FileMaker server, you back up the record data only. Um, and so if you're storing your container data outside of the database, like externally stored, external secure, external open on the, on the database, the storage menu for the container fields or whatever inside of FileMaker, um, then you can, there's, there's just, there's some ops stuff that you can do to make that work a lot better at large data set sizes. Um, but it, it, but neither of those things, you know, upsides or downsides to that doesn't really tell you which way to go. Um, and I, I don't, I think both are good. Um, some of our customers, for example, uh, have, I think one of our, it's one of our um, mid-level engineers actually has built something for a client where uh, all of the files, so I, you upload them into the container, right? There's a process on the back end that pulls them out and sticks them in Dropbox, actually, um, because Dropbox, for example, has an API where you can upload files uh, into the Dropbox account with API keys. And so, you know, uh, once something is a certain age, it's not likely to be needed immediately and in front of me, um, you know, in front of the users or whatever. So then they, can, they get it out of the solution. So it's not sitting there in the backups every hour. Um, and so those things can be kind of pushed into an archive, if you will, not like a separate archive file, but you know, just a, a, a different way of storing it. Uh, there's a, you have to pull it out of Dropbox and back into FileMaker if you want to look at it, et cetera. Um, but also with stuff like that, uh, especially for things like Dropbox, if you're going to use something like that, there's like a, they have a command where you can get a link to the file. And so then you could uh, automatically fire that into the user's browser, for example. Um, you could use Amazon S3 for that same sort of purpose. There's all kinds of different solutions. So I would just say in general, it basically it's a giant conversation. Um, and that every, it's it's like you have to figure out what your requirements are because that, that's where it actually goes. Um, it doesn't. It isn't as much as oh, this one's the best or this one's less. So you have to look at what what you want to do, how, who your users are, how they interact with the application, etc., um, and get that. Yeah, basically, okay. <laughs> look at that so, stuff and figure out what's best. So, so we've got one more question before we move on. Are there tools or logs to do some high level analysis? What solutions are using one amount of DAPI data? Um, good question. Um. I believe so as far as I know the answer to that question is I've never seen anything like that um, I can't say it doesn't exist because maybe somebody has built it um, but I have not um, the, the most what do you call that the most fine-grained data I've ever gotten out of DAPI is the fact that RCC has a bunch of different servers all on our license and I can go look at each of them and try and add up the numbers and figure out where the data is going <laughs> uh, but actually I was surprised recently because I looked at our main um, our main server and our main server has used like four point something gigs of uh, DAPI data which is higher than I would expect um, and so actually yes Oregon Dean I am quite interested in tooling around that or maybe I have to build that because nobody else will or you know whatever um, 
I actually may do. We'll see, we'll see about that. I should put that. I should put that on my to-do list. <laughs> <laughs> it'll never get done just to be clear but <laughs> but it's uh that would be a cool thing to do um uh, kyle says there's software like that for web developers not sure about filemaker developers though uh, mm -hmm. usually goes to the resource monitor on windows server yeah right and um and so like general tools like that like y you could put a uh, what are those things called? You know, a packet inspector, or what, that kind of a thing on the server to try and keep track of stuff. That would work fine. Um, mm -hmm. But all of those things have overhead, et cetera. So it would be it would be excellent and nice for us as developers if, uh, for example, the data API itself had some concept of what was being asked for. And actually, I bet oh, that would be interesting. Actually, I'm just thinking the cool thing would be because it knows what layout you're doing work on. Um, you could associate the data usages with the individual layout, which would be, that would probably get you, that wouldn't solve the problem, but that would, you, you know, you could break stuff out in a way where you could subsequently analyze it or something like that. But mm -hmm. I don't know, I'm just sort of, <laughs> that would be cool. All right, looks like we're having a little problem on the YouTube. I'm going to try to fix that. Uh, what else we got, Jacob? All right. Oh, yeah, they're conversing. So, um Oh, and that's good. You guys are moving on to the questions about <laughs> about setting the RAM cache and stuff like that. So this is the, this is the. I know the other things are like one, two, three. Uh, number four is the one that I. It's like the horse that I like to wail on occasionally, um, more than occasionally. Honestly, it's like every time I get on. So uh, if you're currently leaving your in-memory, your FileMaker server in-memory cache at the default, which will be 512 megabytes, um, unless you're database is like you know 100 megs or you know you fmsp and you've got your 100 customers or something um if you have any if you have a solution that's bigger than that your ram cache should be higher um and that also goes with more ram for the machine itself as well so um that's just something to note uh, i have my little math equation here for what we usually set it as um the the i mentioned yesterday there's some nuance with setting this and so the, the short version of the nuance is actually that if you set it at this, so for example, if you had a 16 gig server, take a gig off, it's 15 gigs. So you cut that in half and it'd be 7,500. Um, if, if setting your in-memory cache that high, we'll say, causes problems, like you have a, a big script that runs in the middle of the night that does all kinds of crazy stuff all over the database and you know all kinds of accounting and maintenance and this sort of stuff um, in one big pass. Um, some of those will use more RAM than you know than that would leave free, basically. Um, and so if it does, uh, then you need to turn your RAM cache down um, or buy a bigger server or rent a bigger server, whatever. Um, you can take that one of two directions. Some of our some of our customers have done uh, either actually either direction. So on one customer, um, they didn't want to buy a bigger uh, server because the next step up was we'll just say prohibitively expensive, um, and so we turned the RAM cache down for that client a little bit until everything kind of you know worked hunky dory. Um, and then other customers, uh, you know, we look at the server and we say, well. Uh, you have additional requirements where you know you're you you were at the right size before the question came up about the giant script that's going to use a bunch of RAM. So we should you know so that basically says that's like the 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 if you only have one thing that says you should upgrade you know maybe you can stay at the same level and tolerate you know, slightly less performance or something like that. But if you have two things and so you've added this script and so now you have two things. Okay. So now we need to upgrade the server to the next level. And so if that means going from eight gigs to 16 gigs of RAM or something like that, um, that would be my recommendation. It's kind of a per case basis, but, um, but in general, if you set it to the default and you don't have anything really wild going on, um, you'll probably be fine. Um, so Okay, right on. Did did we get to the question? Uh, is it better to have a container a separate file or a separate table? Um, I did not cover that one, but that's a good question. Um, hmm. Let me think about that. I I have to I have to wonder. I'm trying to think if it would matter either way. I'm sure there's some, there's I know there's advantages. So actually, I can think of like really persnickety stuff 
um, where there would be an advantage to having, uh, you know, if you did, you had a, you had a, an actual, like a singular database, maybe with a table in it and you put your, you had a files table or something like that. Um, and then even still you, you know, put all of the container data storage, external secure, external open or something like that. And then just cross-referenced it via file inter, inter file relationships. Um, mm -hmm. that would, I can think of a couple, I don't, I don't know that it would matter necessarily like for real. Um, I guess there's a couple of things that that would do. For example, um, if you're using UUIDs for those file, uh, like that's what you're using for your key field, um, that may provide some advantages because uh, FileMaker only guarantees that those UUIDs are unique. I think it's per file. If maybe someone, um, hopefully someone will correct me if I'm talking out of my butt, but uh, but I, I believe it's per file. And so if you wanted to guarantee unique file names, for example, um, you might split it out that way. Uh, in general, um, I, I, in my own solutions, I build a files table um, and then basically kind of just do the foreign key thing and then whatever key field works, uh, you know, the relationship functions now. So, you know, I, I like I, I have a hosting database and we we carry all kinds of, you know, we have all kinds of little files, documents, keys, whatever, all you know, installers, blah, 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 all this stuff. Um, but they're and but the and so that table is a, is a files table and it has its own foreign key field like how it relates to something else. And I just use the same foreign key field. I know Richard actually doesn't do that. He usually has key fields specific to the thing you're relating to. So you'd have a, an ID server and an ID whatever, an ID contact you know, on that table so that you can explicitly relate those across. Um, I've been doing it in one individual field and then the the keys for the tables, right? Like a server is a server 123 and the, you know, the contacts is contact number 173, whatever. So, and so it won't, they won't relate because the key doesn't work. Um, dun, 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 dun. Yeah. Oh, Kyle Williams. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, have it, thinking it's helpful to have a separate file so you can manage the container data. Um, and that's that's real, especially if you need to make like structural changes to that file um, or you're, you know, you're trying to deal with it separately for backups. Actually, that's a good point. No, I didn't think about that. So if you did a backup schedule that was specific to that file um, and maybe that's an interesting one, actually. I like that as a concept because you can do on the FileMaker server admin console, you can program a backup schedule for an individual database. And so if you put all of your container data just in that file, uh, you could back it up um, you know, basically on an unrelated basis to everything else. So if you're like, nope, that's my files table. Like I don't really care about it that much. It only needs to be backed up every day because you know, people are only going to add documents you know, on a hourly-ish basis. It's not real time. Um, that would be that would be an interesting and real thing um, that you could do. Uh, might help with some snapshots and stuff like that, especially if you were doing like on hosting, doing on-site hosted virtual servers or something like that. Um, yeah, interesting. Anyway, that's a good idea. Mm -mm. Oh yeah. Kyle says it makes sense it. when you have more than 100 gigabytes of PDFs attached to your file. Oh yeah. <laughs> the the biggest one I think the biggest one we ever put up on Amazon was one was 120 gigs of documents I think something like that that wasn't too bad um wait it's a, it there's an interesting that's kind of a digression but there's an interesting cost curve on Amazon because at some point and it's somewhere over 100 gigs but under a terabyte where the the math doesn't it goes back towards not making sense again to to do it virtual. Um, Amazon at that scale is kind of expensive, at least for an individual server. Um, and so people look at look at the numbers and go, well, I could buy a server. And so <laughs> they're like, eh. so it's like there there are it's 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 just a different set of trade offs though. So like the Amazon, you know, the disk space basically is what ends up expensive in that situation. Um, and that's it's not necessarily bad, but. Uh, you know, you you make different trade offs if you're going to do on site hosting versus in in Amazon and that kind of thing. So, hmm. interesting. Um, That's interesting. Let's see. Do 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 do. 
Um, so I'll cover this one very shortly. So I, we talked about this previously. We have the link here. Um, the part of this that needs to be updated, basically, I mentioned there was part of this that needed to be updated. So there's some there's some stuff that's just not covered in this document because it's from uh, it's from 19, basically. Um, there were some interesting changes and and feature support weird support matrices um, for specifically 19.2 as a result of Claris um, introducing uh, HTTP2 support. Um, HTTP is the kind of the communication medium that we use for sending web pages back and forth. Um, and that is also what uh, the data API uses. It The data format is JSON, but how it's structured is uh, HTTP. Like that's the kind of the container, if you will. Hold on, I'm getting a drink of water. I say hi, Jay, Jacob. Born yes, out there, drink absolutely. your water. I got to get one of those twitchy, the the twitchy mugs that says "drink your water." Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so, on so for the data API particularly, um, one of the changes that happened that's just interesting. It, it, I'll just tell about it because it, it caused some problems for us at one point. So. When they switched to, there's HTTP 1.1, which you want to go all the way back to the 90s, I can explain why it's 1.1 and not like 1.0 or whatever, but uh, but the new one's 2, 2.0. Um, and one of the things that they changed basically, it's, and it was actually just because it was never standardized previously, um, when you log into either the data API or the XML API, um, if you're trying to program this directly, you're not using a library or something like that. Um, the way that the server gives you that, you know, you log in, you send it your username and password, it goes and checks and says, yep, they can log into FileMaker, great. You know, it can log into the database. Um, and then once that's good, uh, you get a little token, which is just a little text string. Um, but the way that they send that back, uh, at least for the XML API, the only way it comes back is on an HTTP header, um, which is like metadata attached to the response. And so you, your code, if, if you're writing a library, you would do this, but if you're not, you know, you can ignore it basically. Um, but the, the code needs to capture that code, capture that little token and, and pass it around for when you're talking to the server in the future. Um, and those headers used to be capitalized. Uh, they're now, or they're either, they were either all caps locked or mixed, um, you know, capital first letters, stuff like that. Um, the new standard is lowercase, <laughs> just lowercase. So everybody has all of this code out there that's written that looks for that FileMaker server uh, token header. I don't remember what the header's name is. I apologize. Um, but when it comes back, uh, their code doesn't find it. Their code says, hey, that header's missing. And it's it's there. It's just it's lowercase. And so it doesn't it doesn't do a it does a, like a strict comparison, not a, a funky one that would pick up that difference. Um, and so anyway, it, it broke it broke the data API library that I wrote, and so I had to push a patch to it. Um, and also, I think that's going to bite more people as they go forward because um, a lot of the documentation out there doesn't take into account the fact that the, the headers can be lowercase. And so what you get back from your code is I, I can't authenticate. What's There's something wrong here. What's, you know, um, either FileMaker or if you're writing PHP or Python or some other language, um, those codes will, they'll return back and say, "Hey, you know, I'm having issues authenticating with this endpoint. What, you know, help, <laughs> human, help me." Um, <laughs> and you're like, "Ah, uh, that doesn't make any sense." And so that's it's a thing to check. You may have to kind of roll up your sleeves and dig into the internals, but um, but that's a thing. And so I, I have to like figure out what to put here for the data API. Uh, but I just want to note that that is a difference. Um, one of the other ones is. Uh, uh, later versions of FileMaker Server 19, I think it, it's definitely 19.2, um, and I forget about 19.1, um, but you should you should go to, if you're going to go to 19, you should go to 19.2. Um, uh, on Windows, at least, it does not include PHP at all. So um, you will need to either bring over the old PHP that was on the system, if you're doing like an upgrade or something like that, uh, or, and you, you actually have to preserve it and put it back um, Claris, uh, like if you run the FileMaker, if you're on Windows and you run a, you're like, you're on FileMaker Server 18, you're like, hey, I'm going to go to 19.2, and you read the really cool thing where Claris says, you know, hey, we can run the 19.2 update or, or the 19.2 installer, and it will just upgrade my stuff automatically. Um, 
and you try that, uh, it will actually it will still get rid of the PHP. So you have to like set it aside and then put it back later and whatever. It's it's silly, but um, but they're they're stripping it out because they don't want to support it any longer. Um, so just a thing to know. Um, and then for number six, do we have, actually hold on? I should pause. Do we have any questions? Have you seen any? Uh, cool. So far, I think we don't have any questions. We've been trying to take care of some Discord links. Um, let's see. Awesome. Uh, yeah, I think we don't have any questions at the moment. But if we have any questions, please feel free to, to reach out. We're we're gonna answer yep. everyone. Yeah, post them. I'll, uh, I'm I'm here for any any that you guys have. Um, so I'll just keep going and we'll I'll check back in. Oh, M Johnson. Um. Um. Oh, M Johnson. Make sure. Sorry, he's saying he's having issues with FileMaker Server 19.2. Um, like it won't load PHP files, which is uh, accurate in certain cir circumstances. But he says it won't also load an HTML or a PNG file in the browser. Um, do make sure that they're in the right place, um, especially since I know you particularly are on a Mac. Um, the There's two locations the files can be, and so you want to make sure it's in the right one. Um, so if you've been... Yeah, so, and you've restarted it as well. Okay, cool. So if you have installed an SSL certificate, there will be a separate directory the files have to go into. If you put any kind of SSL directory in there. Um, otherwise, yeah, they should it should just sit in the HT docs. Okay, interesting. Um, check permissions. That's the other thing on Mac that matters. Um, the, sometimes the file permissions won't come over in a way. Still don't render, okay. Yeah, we might have to take a look at that. Let me know. Um, so for number six here, um, the big thing, and this is, again, this is, I'm repeating stuff. This is an old change. Uh, and actually this, oh, that, that's a good one. This one, this direction actually is not quite correct anymore. So it's correct for 18. It's not correct for 19. So um, for, if you need uh, web direct particularly, which is why most people will want it, um, or if you're using the web presentation engine, which is um, kind of the XML API stuff, uh, you will need Java to run that. Um, we are generally recommending Amazon Coretto uh, is what it's called. Um, they have more money than God, and so they build their own Java. Um, it, for your purpose, for everybody's purposes, is the same as the Oracle one that came before. Um, that Oracle re redid their licensing and whatever blew up everybody's day about a, maybe a year and a half ago. Um, Claris's solution to the license change problem was to just remove it from the product, and then WebDirect doesn't come with FileMaker Server out of the box anymore. Basically, I mean, it's it's literally there, but you can't run it without without um, without installing Java. Um, and Java is not installed on uh, Windows and Mac. Uh, Java does come on Linux, actually. Um, it will it will drag it in for you. Um, so that's a thing to know. Uh, and the thing that's slightly wrong about what I've done, this little sentence that I've highlighted here, um, is because so on 18, this is correct. You have to. It pops up a thing and says, "Hey, do you want uh, do you want Open JDK or do you want Oracle Java?" And what that actually is is a question about um, are you going to give FileMaker Server the copy of Java that I'm going to use, uh, and, and you'll hand it like a zip file basically with with the stuff in it, and there's you can look at the documentation for how, for how to fetch one of those, um, or does the server already have Java installed? You know, generally uh, globally available, um, and that would be something like if you ran a Credo installer, or you installed uh, Oracle Java, or you know anything like that. Um, then you know if it looks for a Java home, something like that, it'll just it'll find Java, and you know it'll be good to go. Okay, um, so on 19. Uh, if it can find a globally installed version of Java that works, um, I assume it does a version check. I actually don't know, uh, but I would hope so. Um, if it's eight or newer, I think is probably what it is. Uh, it will go okay, and it'll just assume that that's fine. Um, one other small change uh, that's not really relevant to this particular thing, but just to note it for you all. Um, if you're running WebDirect um, on server, FileMaker Server 19.2, particularly, um, Claris has changed their recommended version uh, of Java. So historically, it's been Java 8. Um, and for those of you who've been around for a minute, you might remember it's been Java 8. And then they'll have some particular patch that they really want you to install. Um, over the last couple of years, that kind of version sensitivity has mostly, as far as I can tell, been gotten out of the product, which is wonderful. Um, but uh, if you're doing server 19.2, um, they are now recommending Java 11. So. 
uh, do note that they they said Java eight is fine for the moment, um, but we're you know move to eleven as you will basically. So um, and I think that just means that they're gonna uh, begin using Java eleven um, commands and, and language features and what have you. So oh, that's good to know. Um, um, I have a question from YouTube. If I'm using a virtual machine on VM, Box, or Citrix, can I still do the backup? Yes. All right, there you have it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, please, yeah, please write out a little bit more uh, about what you're asking. So I, the short answer is yes, um, but it, but it will. Uh, I suspect the question is about how you'll be doing backups and um, kind of what that looks like. Uh, and so I, I would love a little more detail. Um, about that because generally the answer is going to be, yeah, of course you can do backups. Um, but like what that means for your business may be different. Um, some people do, they'll do onsite servers and then, you know, your, your FileMaker server VM is there and then you have underlying, you know, the host operating system and the guest operating system. And for the guest, which is the FileMaker server, you can do things like snapshot backups. Um, and those work great actually, except, um, you can, so FileMaker Server doesn't know anything about vo volume shadow copy, um, volume shadow service, which if you're running Windows, you know exactly what that is. FileMaker Server isn't cognizant of it. It has no idea what that is. And so when a volume shadow, uh, the, the little alerts that it does go out and say, hey, you know, we're gonna take a snapshot in about five seconds. Um, most Windows applications, uh, especially server ones, they know exactly what to do with that. They pause or they do a cleanup or a maintenance or a, and they hold on for a second, whatever. Um, there's all kind, of whatever, it depends on the application, what happens, but um, but they know what that means. They know that signal says, oh, we need to hold on for a second. Um, FileMaker server doesn't know what that is and doesn't respect it. Um, and so as a result of that, uh, if you take a snapshot, your live databases that are open on the server currently um, are not useful. But if you take, for example, hourly, even 15 minutely backups, um, those will be fine. So, very good. And then we have, a, right. we have a comment from somebody. A uh, comment from the boss. Yes. Installing FileMaker server is a giant pain in the butt. That's not exactly what he said, but uh, <laughs> I'm a little bit more candid than he is. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, it's. Uh, yeah, one one of the things like I actually hope that Claire shows up to some of these things because like I, I know like part part of it is I'm doing user education for you all, and then like the other half of it is also there's some of this stuff that's sharp edges that don't necessarily need to be. Um, it would take work on behalf of you know on Claris's part to correct those things and to make those easier. Um, and in general, they have been so like I, you know I don't have any like that kind of complaints. Um, in fact, but uh, but there's some stuff that like. Man, it's like I, you know, you can tell that they're they're doing cloud internally, and so I'm sure the Linux stuff will get cleaned up really fast. But there's there's just there's a there's enough sharp edges remaining in the Windows install experience um, that yeah, it's 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 uh, it's challenging. And I, I have a little list of things that I would love if they were uh, uh, a little less sharp um, or better out of the box. Um, is actually the that's that's where I'd really like to be is some of the some of the defaults like. I, I would love to change them basically um, especially actually very specifically what's the one it's uh, oh here it is yeah so number eight actually this is if, if I had if I could like you know sit down with the CEO and uh, say hey you know here's one I could do one change in the software it would be this um, might need to move forward in the PDF yeah we're, we're, we're almost done there's only a couple oh actually there's a ton left <laughs> cool um, so away it, it, these are these are all short and straightforward. So uh, you want to email, you want to enable email notifications. You will need an SMTP, which is the send type of email. Uh, or there's SMTP, and then you have POP and IMAP for receiving email. Um, for you want to you want to have credentials for that. Um, so it will it will email you whenever anything goes wrong, um, and that's everything from your license is expired, uh, somebody got locked out of a database because they logged in with the wrong password too many times, um, all kinds of little stuff like that, um, as well as like a backup failed or, or whatever. It's, it's very useful information. Um, some of it's honestly spam actually. There's a couple, I have a, I have a couple, I have exactly two email um, rules in my email client that get rid of a couple of emails and it's because they never, they never mean anything. Um, anyway. 
if uh, Claire's PM wants to reach out, that would be fantastic. Uh, <laughs> um, so auto open databases no will save you in crash scenarios from the database server automatically trying to reopen the file on top of a, on top of a crash. Um, that's just a straightforward thing. We increase the volume of logs so that we can scroll back forever in the in the history and identify any kind of issues that might happen, or if we have to go all the way, you know, spelunking into the deep history of the server to figure out what's up or this weird thing that's been happening or whatever. Um, it makes that stuff useful. Uh, Let's see. Do, 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 do. Get all of this. Sorry, I'm checking the chats. Um, I think we're pretty good on the chats for now. Okay, perfect. Yeah, Kyle has a good one, but we're going to address it shortly. Um, as always, I tell everybody backups, backups, backups. If you have an on site server, um, it's a little more complicated when it's a virtual server, but um, the, the short version of it is backups go everywhere. So that may mean different things depending on how your server's set up. Um, in Virtual servers, we tend to have a backups drive, and then you just ensure that that is snapshotted or Veeam offsite, you know, whatever or, or whatever. You, there's uh, there's a hundred thousand different vendors for backups, and most of them are fine, basically. Um, but you just want to make sure that that data is somewhere else. Um, there's different ways to align that, but as many backups as you can all over the place so that you have, you know, the machine gets eaten by a power loss, the site is hit by a flood, the west coast, I don't know, falls off into the ocean. There's yeah. all kinds of, um, yeah, there's all kinds of <laughs> different things that could happen. I, I have some customers that, you know, they want multi-regional um, backups in Amazon where, mm -hmm. uh you know, Amazon has a, like, they're going to be hosted in Northern California. Well, maybe we have the big one that could end badly for that region and that, that region as it's called a subset of data centers for Amazon. Um, and so maybe they want, you know, copies of their database put somewhere else around the country. Maybe they want them over in Virginia or Ohio or, I don't know, maybe even another jurisdiction so that they can ensure that they're absolutely somewhere else. Yeah. Yeah, Amy Shields says, as an insurance, and I'm just going to read your message, Amy. <laughs> as an insurance adjuster, this can't be stressed enough. Multiple backups in numerous locations. And I, I'll say it because that's perfect. That's exactly right. Um, as many as you can have, because the problem is not, ha the problem is never having too many. The problem is not having enough. Um, that is the only issue you will ever run into. You might be concerned about the cost at some level of uh, paranoia, but uh, most honestly, most of that money is going to be well spent, and most people honestly just don't go far enough with with having enough backups everywhere. Um, and so, if they're spending a little extra money, maybe a little even too much money on backups, that's still good money to spend because if the bad thing you're concerned about happening does happen, you'll be fine. Um, you always have to get the. It's you know it's like you're gonna have a time to restoration. There'll be you know if you have to buy new hardware, set something up, reach out to RCC to build you a virtual one, whatever. All of that will be you'll be you'll be sitting just fine if you're sitting there staring at your perfectly working backup that's sitting there in Amazon or some other location around the country, different from where the explosion happened. Um, that will never be a bad place to be. So you can just sit on that. <laughs> Server wisdom with JT. Yes. Yeah, oh, Oregon Dean posted that too. That's that's the perfect oh, yeah. one. So, yeah, no, 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 there's this link that he literally just posted. So, um, uh, it, it, if you guys weren't aware, a giant data center in France uh, uh, by a company named OVH um, burned to the ground uh, about a was it a week or a week and a half ago, something like that. Um, bunch of websites, they're just gone. Um, if you didn't have any kind of resilient backup somewhere else. Uh, you know, you might get your data back. Um, we're going to find out. I, I haven't kept up on it, actually. I'm not sure what they're doing. Um, but because OVH, like, you can do backups with them as well. And so if they had multiple multi-location redundant backups, actually, you might be fine. Um, but I know there's, like, there were some sites that they were just down after that because their server melted. So, like, literally super, melted. Super important. Backups are super important. Yep. Um, do do do. Yeah, SSL certificate is good. Um, always install those. Uh, we we basically blanket recommend these at this point. Um, there are enough features that Claris is be beginning to put behind the SSL wall, if you will, um, that you should generally just do that. Um, for on-site servers, the conversation is slightly different, not because there isn't like a risk there, but 
um, just because of the, the local access issues that users tend to have because if you're typing in the public IP address of the server or the public DNS address of the server, like it's not gonna, it may not necessarily work right. You have to do stuff on your local network to make that work like flawlessly, you know, totally transparent to users. Um, and that's kind of difficult because it requires fancy networking hardware that's different from what you might get from your internet service provider. Um, but those sort of, I'll just say operational sort of challenges aside, we, we still, we just generally as a blanket statement recommend SSL um, just so that you're, just so that you have that in place, um, honestly, so that your data is not being read by whoever's popping by on your Wi-Fi or anything over the internet, or if you have people that work out in the field or work out of Starbucks or, you know, things like that. Um, I guess maybe people aren't working out of Starbucks that much anymore, but I'm, I think that will resume shortly. So um, that will, that will again become a risk. Um, and then, yeah. And then just a, a couple of general, these are more general recommendations. So on windows, particularly actually, um, it, uh, FileMaker Server has, for reasons I'm not 100% clear on, just to be honest with everybody, um, has had issues uh, reliably, like always, like perfectly every time, um, cleaning up some of its temp files, con you know, container data temp stuff, et cetera, that gets spat into the Windows temp directory. Um, and so one of the things that we do that solved a bunch of problems, especially for clients that do a ton of container data stuff um, it may not, you know, you have plenty of disk space on your server, ton, you know, you have a, a whole drive for container data. Great. Um, but parts of that get spat into the Windows temp directory. And so if your Windows boot drive fills, you're going to have an issue just <laughs> straight up. Um, and so one of the things that you can do to help with that is to set up um, Clean Manager is the name of that the little disk cleaner utility that comes built into Windows. Um, if you set one of those up, you can... Um, Google the docs online, to be honest, but you can set it up so that they have like a pre-programmed list of things that gets cleaned. And then if you schedule that pre-programmed list to be run, you can automatically clean your temp directory, for example, on a weekly basis. Um, and so uh, I don't, this isn't something I notice. It isn't something any of our customers like notice or care about. Um, but basically when we instituted this on our windows servers, most of which run on Amazon, uh, it eliminated uh, the whole, the entire problem of customers filling their boot disk on accident with, uh, you know, bum, bum container temp files or whatever. So it just totally eliminated the problem. Um, so I, I, it's, it's like a small tweak, but you know, do it. <laughs> do you recommend the boot drive be on a separate partition than where FileMaker uh, servers install, uh, FileMaker servers no. store? Them? Um, I don't think I recommend for or against that. Um, think it I, some customers do it because they want all uh for example uh, i'm thinking of somebody actually uh that we've worked we've been working with recently um th yeah they have like the windows boot drive and then there's like a d drive and that has the filemaker server like all the apps pro and server um and their databases and all this stuff and it's a big nvme drive and so everything is screaming fast and then they have backups that go you know to the to the whatever the other hard drive and stuff like that um i i think that i think for some of that stuff it's kind of a personal choice just make sure that you have enough room basically um that's that's the big one um because if it, the thing is is filling the windows drive uh i don't have a technical explanation for what happens but my colloquial description is that it pisses windows off um windows really just doesn't like it at all um and i you know new actually I, to be honest newer windows is more resilient to it which is that which is that after you reboot assuming it's not still full um it windows will work reasonably uh, historically that's actually not been true i've i've honestly destroyed windows installations by filling the disk at the wrong time so um it's yeah, it, it, that stuff makes me nervous. That's why we figured this out and set it up. But, um, but as far as like doing that specifically, eh, don't fill your. As long as whatever you're doing isn't filling your boot drive, you know, it's basically a personal choice. And if it's actually just a partition on the same drive, probably sure. Why not? Yeah, if you have it, if you're doing on-site hosting. So, all right, got a couple more points here. We'll try to skim through these. I know our, our time is we've gone over it a little bit. So. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I want to. I want to. We'll we'll shut it down in uh, max fifteen minutes. I think um, okay. our things should be set for two hours, if I'm not mistaken, um, which should take us all the way to three. I don't intend to actually drag everybody all the way to three. Oh, we could. Uh, also, I, well, I have a meeting at three, so. <laughs> Copy that. Um, I, and, and there's only a couple of things left here. So, for if you're going to run server 18, which some people still do because they're nervous about 19, um, one install the very latest version of 18. It's got to be 18 v4. Um, or patch four, uh, and then turn off startup restoration, which I have the command here for. Um, please do that. Uh, it 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 doesn't solve all of the problems, but it solves about ninety five percent of the issues um, with the the, the database uh, engine record locking code that was enabled by default in 18. That code is what enables the startup restoration feature. Um, so it's very cool. I'm like excited about. The potential of something like that being included in the product, especially um, once it's like really ready to go in production, um, I, those are that's like an unalloyed good, a transaction log or something like that's going to be great. But uh, that's that's not ready to go yet, so you have to turn it off in 18, 19, uh, 19.0 and forward um, doesn't include that. They tried a different approach to the whole record locking thing. The first version of that code shipped in FileMaker Server 19.1. The second version of that code shipped in FileMaker Server 19.2, which is the current version. Um, and that is the one, if you're going to go to 19, that I would recommend. I would recommend 19.2. Um, some of our customers uh, have had some excellent, frankly, excellent um, speed improvements from 19.2. Um, they are trying to make it so that uh, grandchild, great-grandchild, et cetera, um, I call them long-distance relationships. We're, we're actually going to we're gonna cover this in a in a week, a two weeks, something like that. I forget. I gotta find the day. Um, uh, I call it long distance relationships. So the but the way that they've restructured the code and how it does stuff, um, it basically makes things that have really long or wild relationships run way faster. And we're we're talking in the the eight to twenty times faster range. It's not like oh thirty percent or something like that. Um, it's big big stuff. And so. Um, for, for some customers, especially uh, specific processes that like run all over the file, and I'm thinking of stuff like big invoicing processes and stuff like that, those speed up like you haven't heard. Um, at, but other stuff, regular record access, it's about, you know, it's a little faster, but it's about the same. It, it's, not, it's not amazingly noticeably faster. Um, but for stuff like that, especially big processes that run on the server, some of that stuff, it's um, I had a customer that went from 18 to 19, and, the, and it's the one that I mentioned yesterday, actually. So they went from 18, they, two things, they went from 18 to 19, um, and they had a, 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 a better uh, FileMaker server in memory cache setting. Um, and those, that's basically, that's the two changes, that's it. Uh, and their, their process that used to take minutes, plural, enough that the admin ladies that ran it would go and get coffee um, and like drink it and have a convo conversation and then come back. Uh, they don't do that anymore because the process now takes about 35 seconds. Um, and so for regular record access, it's not gonna change too much. It's specifically about long distance stuff. So, um, and then the two final ones that are super quick. Um, so historically, Claris is recommended against antivirus um, because it's a performance hit. Uh, that's generally true. We specifically recommend Windows Defender, especially on Windows, um, because Windows Defender was made by Microsoft. And when you exclude a directory from Windows Defender's real-time scanning, um, it's Microsoft's code, so it can actually, like, correctly or fully or whatever um, disengage from scanning those files, whereas uh, third-party antivirus, um, some of them are quite fast, just to be clear, but uh, third-party antivirus has to load up, see that that's an excluded directory, and then bail before that happens, whereas my understanding is at least that Windows Defender can actually just disconnect from scanning those files um, because it has access to some kind of Windows API or is written to actually use it or, or what have you, something like that. Um, and so that's what we do. We basically just exclude the software directories and then let it run everywhere else. Um, and then the last one is... Um, uh, we say for remote desktop, and it's especially relevant for Windows systems, but uh, the general principle here is administrative functions should only be accessible to administrators, whatever that means. So if you're going to limit 
you know, if remote desktop's only going to be accessed from on-site, don't expose it to the internet. Don't, just don't. Um, and if there's, yeah, just don't do it. Um, and if there's, you know, if you have like a corporate VPN or something like that, and like the IT guy has his own IP, for example, me, I have my own IP um, that I that I give for remote, I, literally for remote access to customer systems sometimes. Um, we're actually streaming through it currently. Uh, <laughs> I'm on the VPN currently, so. Um, nice. So, but you can do stuff like that. So if you say, yep, only that IP can log, you know, of the offsite, everybody else that's on the entire internet, the one, the, you know, the IT VPN or something like that, that can log in. Okay, um, stuff like that, totally cool. But you want to think about things in that fashion where who needs access and when and from where, um, and then limit things uh, as appropriate. So that's it. All right, um, very good. Have we accrued right. any questions in the interim? Is everyone tired of me talking? <laughs> uh, the, I, I could never get tired of hearing you talk, Jacob. You're so smart. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of chatter here. Let's see, um, talking about disk drives and crystal disks. Um, I've never heard of that. Um, have you heard of a crystal disk, Jacob? Crystal disks, extremely expensive. Is that, um, is that the new kind of platter drive? Uh, I have heard some people I guess that's probably different from the ones I'm thinking of. The ones that the ones that the ones that I would call crystal disks. I just I people have been working on. Um, it's like totally unrelated to FileMaker, but people have been working on um, kind of I'd call it data resiliency um, or the ability to write data to what I'll call a drive or a storage medium generally, um, and then have it sit for I don't know a thousand years or something like like for real. Um, and so I know that there has been technical work um, in that general direction and people have come up with some cool stuff. And it's, it's the kind of stuff where, you know, you, if you think about it, it's what you'd hear about like with, um, was it Voyager or one of those early robots? We, we, we took like uh, some, some packets of uh, human culture and, you know, put them on the robot and sent them into space because somebody might, you know, figure out how to read a record you know, some alien might figure out how to read a record 55,000 years from now or something. Um, like it's that kind of thing. So I, I'm not, I don't, oh, crystal disc mark. Got it. Okay. That's a, di yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a testing application. Okay. That's different. Cool. Um, yeah. Crystal, crystal disc info and crystal disc mark. Those are, um, what'd you call that? They're, they're, um, they're useful testing applications. They run on windows, at least for now. Um, and their O5D data. Ah, okay. Thank you, William, Kyle. I'll uh, read that and then talk, maybe talk cogently about it later. But um, yeah, so, sorry, just as far as random products go, Crystal Disk Info will give you, uh, it's a Windows utility that will give you, you download it and run it. It'll tell you the, um, if your drive makes available what's called smart data, which will tell you if the hard drive itself is failing. Um, yes, even your hard drive has its own computer inside of it. Uh, uh, and so if that drive is whatever, it has metrics that it reports, basically little numbers. And so um, Crystal Disk Info will look at those numbers and sit and tell you if there's anything concerning. Um, the program that we use to do that on Mac is called Drive DX, um, and it's an excellent one. Same thing, it'll give you like a, a percent lifetime on the drive and stuff like that, um, and tell you if it's in pre-failure mode. Uh, and if it is, I'm gonna have a very hard conversation with you that you need to replace it ASAP. A sap as soon as possible. Um, that's why we do backups, right? Correct. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and and like normal boring stuff is, hey, your drive fails or something like that. I know we're always talking about, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> a, a, a semi hit the building on fire while you know the flood was happening. It's that, you know this kind of like act of God type stuff. Um, but to be honest, most of the actual problems people run into is like the backup hard drive failed because it's you know seven years old or something um <laughs> and so it's there's 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 under underneath these these recommendations there are also basics um I, i'll just say for everybody if you didn't know it there's smart data that's what it's called it's all smart as an acronym s-m-a-r-t uh and and all almost all hard drives report that and i'll just say for every operating system on the face of the planet there is a program that you can read that data with um depend if you're on Linux or something like that you might have to learn how to interpret the data because uh, 
at least most of the apps I've used on Linux don't actually, they were, they, they give you the numbers, but they don't like tell you what to do with it. Um, drive DX tells you what to do with it. That's the one that runs on Mac. Um, crystal disk info, uh, doesn't really tell you what to do with it, but it does turn funny colors and get mad at you if there's a, a problem. Um, and that's, that's also useful information. Um, similar, similarly, similarly. So. All right. Well, thank you for that, Jacob. Uh, it doesn't look like we have any more questions in uh, YouTube or Twitch or Discord here. So, but uh, thank you everyone for coming. We really appreciate you here. Um, we appreciate you coming and supporting every week. Uh, we appreciate you supporting by purchasing bundles and, and just being wonderful people all around. So thank you so much. All right, you guys, thank you so much. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to support at rcconsulting.com and we will see you all again next week. Yep, absolutely. Great job up front, protecting this quarterback to give you a chance. And that's all you can ask for. Oh. Trying to rally down 10. 9.25 to go here in the fourth. Short motion by Amendola from the left. Brady takes the shot to snap. Stands in, throws it left for Amendola. Reaches up and snaps a high throw and lands inside the 10. Ooh. Rolling to the 9. Ball slightly behind him, but Danny makes the grab.